Let's begin with something surprisingly simple. You're walking down a hill. Gravity pulls you down. You stumble and fall on your face. Sorry about that. Your body will definitely obey the geometry of the hill, and ultimately, of the Earth itself. Einstein's equations describe how space and time themselves curve in response to matter and energy. But here's the weird thing. Even if we remove all matter and energy, these equations still have solutions. Theoretically, these equations could describe entire universes, not just one, but infinitely many. So how many solutions are there to Einstein's field equations? The honest answer is, we don't know. But we do know this, this number is huge, probably infinite. Einstein's equations are 10 interlinked nonlinear partial differential equations. Actually, there should be 16 of such equations, since each side has ranked two symmetric tensors, meaning it has two indices, mu and nu, and is symmetric under exchange. But only 10 of such equations are independent because of this symmetry, which implies that in the matrix representation of these tensors, the components in each triangle here are the same. So all we need to do is count the number of components inside one of the triangles plus the diagonal rectangle. Again, these are the 10 equations. Let's see some concrete examples now. But before that, I would like to say that we attached to the description of this video a document called the Catalog of Spacetime, in which you'll find the most famous solutions to Einstein's equations. Also, if you guys are enjoying the content, please do not forget to like the video and to subscribe to the channel. Let's see the first one, Minkowski spacetime. In Cartesian coordinates t, x, y, z, the Minkowski metric is this. And so the line element is this one. This line element tells us how spacetime itself measures intervals between nearby events. This metric is flat, meaning that all components of the Riemann curvature tensor vanish, which implies that the Einstein tensor is also zero everywhere. This is a vacuum solution of Einstein's equations with lambda equals zero. So the cosmological constant responsible for what we call dark energy is set to zero everywhere. Let's see the next one now. But before that, if you guys want to help us grow on YouTube, please consider becoming a member of the channel. We really appreciate your support. Second, Schwarzschild spacetime. In spherical coordinates, the Schwarzschild metric is this. We have here the gravitational constant, the total mass of the body that we're studying, and the speed of light. It describes how a massive object with spherical symmetry, like a planet or a star, bends space-time around it, and inside of it as well, as we'll see in a moment. The line element here looks like this. This is also a vacuum solution for t mu nu equals zero. And as a consequence, we have that Einstein tensor g mu nu is also zero. However, it does not mean that the curvature is zero. The fact that the space-time is flat implies that the Einstein tensor is zero. But the opposite is not necessarily true. Hey, but what about inside the massive body? Inside, we cannot assume t mu nu to be zero, because there is clearly matter and energy there. Instead, Einstein's equations are often solved by approximating the star or the planet you are dealing with as a perfect fluid. The stress-energy tensor takes this form, where rho is the energy density, p is pressure, and the terms u mu and u nu are four velocities. This specific stress energy tensor produced this Schwarzschild interior solution, for which the line element is this. Now, before moving on, there are three important things to notice here. First, a point at infinity. Let's pick a point at infinity and see what happens with the Schwarzschild metric there. As we've seen up to this point, there are two possible Schwarzschild metrics, one for points in its interior and another one for points in its exterior. Since we want to see what happens to the metric at a point at infinity, and we'll see in a moment what that means, then we clearly must use the Schwarzschild exterior metric for r that tends to infinity, and that's what we get. I mean, 
Look at the time and radial entries, which are identical to the ones for the Minkowski metric. It does make sense, since if you move infinitely far from a massive object, its gravitational influence tends to zero. In other words, you find yourself, practically speaking, in a flat portion of space-time. More technically, we would say that at infinity, space-time is asymptotically flat, locally Minkowski in the time and radial components, or directions. Okay, but what about those ugly infinity symbols in the angular entries? Well, as r tends to infinity, the sphere becomes infinitely large. So the metric components for angular directions diverge, simply reflecting the fact that moving a tiny angle at infinity sweeps an infinite physical distance. In the limit, all directions collapse to the same ideal point at infinity, similar to what happens in projective geometry. Don't worry if you've never studied projective geometry before. The intuition is really simple, but very powerful at the same time, and Sophia will be the one to tell you guys about it. In projective geometry, you can do something called compactification of the Euclidean plane by adding points at infinity. Each family of parallel lines meets at a unique point at infinity, and the collection of such points forms the line at infinity. Of course, this line looks more like a circle in our drawing here, because we can't really represent on screen a line at infinity. But I hope you get the idea. Anyway, the correct and precise Minkowski metric that you get, written in spherical coordinates after moving infinitely away from the massive body, is this. 2. Metric right on the surface. What happens if we take the interior Schwarzschild metric and study it for a point on the surface on the spherical body? Well, let's see. Check this out. We just recovered the exterior Schwarzschild metric at a point r equals r, so on its surface. I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. 3. Singularity Now, we're ready for the coolest part of the video. Let's start with the exterior metric, since it's the simplest one. And to make things more tangible, let us pick the planet Earth as our massive body. Recall the value of the gravitational constant g and the speed of light c. First, we substitute these values. Then, we can clearly see that if r equals 2 gm divided by c squared, which is approximately 8.87 millimeters, we get the following metric. Which is actually nonsense, because we just contradicted ourselves. Did you catch where exactly that was? Well, you don't need to know the exact radius of the Earth off the top of your head, which is 6,371 kilometers, by the way in order to notice that a point at the distance 8.87 millimeters from the center is located inside our planet, and therefore we cannot use the exterior Schwarzschild metric as we just did. This is a contradiction. The correct approach would be to use the interior Schwarzschild metric. Let's change reality a little bit and assume the same identical situation, with the only tiny difference being that the radius of Earth is less than 8.87 millimeters. In order to make that true, we'd have to compress the entire mass of our planet to a volume equivalent to a ball with radius less than 8.87 millimeters. This would be an extremely dense object, but if it were created, then all of a sudden this metric turns out to be a consistent physical model, since we're located outside the body now. In this metric, as you can see, the time component is zero, which means that time appears frozen to distant observers. The radial component diverges, indicating a singularity, so a point of infinite curvature. Congratulations, you just learned a scientific formula for producing a black hole. So we can transform any massive object, including the Earth, into a black hole. All we have to do is find a way of compressing it until it crosses the physical limit, below which its radius is less than twice the gravitational constant times the mass of the body divided by the speed of light squared. This physical limit is called the event horizon, and the limiting radius is the Schwarzschild radius. A question that can naturally pop up in your head right now is this. So if I can turn any object with mass into a black hole, then what really counts here is the ratio of mass over volume. As long as the volume is tiny, I don't need a lot of mass to produce a singularity. But then what happens when I want to transform a very little mass into a black hole by compressing it inside of a volume equivalent to a ball of radius less than the Planck scale? If the object's radius becomes smaller than its Schwarzschild radius, 
it forms a black hole, regardless of how large or small the mass is. For small masses, the Schwarzschild radius becomes extremely tiny. If the Schwarzschild radius drops below the Planck length, then the black hole description enters a regime where general relativity and quantum mechanics blend together, and quantum gravity effects dominate. Currently, nobody knows what happens in this quantum gravity realm. The only thing we can say for sure is that classical general relativity is not valid anymore, and that quantum mechanics and gravity must both somehow be taken into account. Such weird objects are called Planck scale black holes, or micro black holes, and that's where speculations about them come from. If you want to see an example in which we calculate what it would take to turn an electron into a black hole, check out the PDF link in the description. The disclaimer is that we would clearly fail at this attempt, since we still have no theory of quantum gravity that matches experiments. But anyway, it's still useful to play with these ideas in order to grasp the intuition behind the math. The last thing I'll say about it is that for our planet Earth, or any other ordinary massive object that is not a black hole, the Schwarzschild radius is much smaller than its physical radius. So the event horizon is located inside the body and has no physical effect for all non-black hole objects, so objects with Schwarzschild radius less than their actual radius. Only when the object is compressed so that its radius becomes smaller than or equal to its Schwarzschild radius does the horizon find itself outside the matter distribution and the object becomes a black hole. In this video, we covered two of the most important solutions of Einstein's field equations, the Minkowski and the Schwarzschild metrics. If you'd like to see a list of famous solutions, check out the PDF link in the description. And if you want a deeper description of each, we attached an amazing material called Catalog of Spacetime in the description of this video. If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you guys there.